Hello, hope you can hear me. Welcome to my presentation, Project Jigsaw and OHGI Microkernel Architecture in the Spotlight. Thank you for coming here today. Firstly, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Anna, I'm a custom application developer and um, enthusiast of and of your helper on subjects related to Java frameworks and IBM Cloud. I share my experience starting with this autumn within the Bucharest Software Craftsmanship Community, which I co-founded together with Victor Renta. He's going to have a talk this Friday, so join his talk also. It's going to be awesome. Um, today's topic is about microkernel architecture, which is a modular monolithic architecture, by the way. Uh, when to employ it in a real-life situation and the tech stack that could sustain it. So firstly, I uh, would like to um, introduce you to the atmosphere of the vacation. And before going in the vacation, most of the time you're, m you're buying an insurance. So when traveling, you're getting an insurance. My surprise is that the insurance is varying based on uh, its price and also its terms and conditions are varying based on my origin and based on my destination. That's something I found out recently this year. So this means is that, that the, the insurance business domain has the same business rules, essentially. However, based on the location, it varies. And those being said, this means that um, each location has its um, uh, certain um, particularities that need to be implemented. Um, and the black locks of the insurance system can be thought as a system that can be uh, can support adding or upgrading independently its geographical behavior. In such a situation, uh, building the system as a microkernel allows developers to add support for new countries and uh, that need um, that are needed in the future or upgrade the already existing one without affecting any other country that was already in there in place. Because we are going to think the system as a core, having most of the functionality of our insurance system and having plugins for each location and hooks for those plugins. Plugins should be designed and created by us developers as safe, contained, and independently deployable. Um, speaking of modules, let's look a bit to our tech stack. So when we're talking about modules, the first thing that comes to our mind is our old beloved OHGI that um, probably many developers do not use nowadays unless they're working on products that are um, um, sold um, like, um, I don't know, application servers or browsers or um, IDs like Eclipse. Um, however, OHGI still has a lot of power and we're going to see that today. Um, and of course, Jigsaw, Java 9 Plus, who introduced modularity for all of us developers. Uh, so those two are going to be the subject of our talk today. Uh, firstly, OHGI is working with uh, bundles in terms of models. So bundle contains your Java classes together with some metadata that describe the capabilities of what your bundle does. That metadata is textual and it's easier for you to, um, to manipulate it and is generated automatically or semi-automatically by a Maven bundle uh, plugin or uh, sometimes by your IDE. Um, and on the other hand, Jigsaw is something that you are maintaining manually as a developer because your metadata is generated when you are compiling the module minus info.java class. So, and you're versioning, you're adding it also when you're making your module. So, um, those being said, there are some pluses and some minuses depending on how much you want to work with your model and how you want to maintain your metadata. Some of us like mostly to maintain Java classes, so we would go with Jigsaw. However, we also like to have things automatically generated, and in this case, OHGI seems to be a very good candidate. Uh, let's look about the change. So OHGI comes with a very important thing for us. It introduces semantic version range. That's something that has been for a while in OHGI. However, in a system like the insurance system, um, you can think as follows. So the core can suffer some minor changes or some uh, micro changes, like in release 1.1.1. And you can export those changes to your other location consumers uh, without being worried that you need to change also the way you are consuming things. Because you have this ability to state in your consumer the fact that you are importing the package using the semantic version range um, that you desire. So in this case, for location X, if you want to have 
only 1.0.0 and did not support anything um, until um, it did not support 2.0.0 package version, you will have the open interval of 1.0.0 that includes the package 1.1.0 and 1.1.1 um, capable to be handled by your location X without changing anything about it. You're just importing it and you are just relying on your runtime that the bundle that's going to exist there is going to export to you that package that you're searching. On the other hand, if you want to restrict the location Y to use just 2.0.0, you're just closing the interval to 1.1.1. So this is a very important for us because in o looking a little bit more higher, in OHGI, you have the ability for two bundles to require a library bundle of two different versions and both versions to be loaded um, because the OHGI is based on class loading. And that makes it possible for us to have this kind of um, inheritance and a dynamic update. However, this kind of situation, sometimes the developers abuse about it and uh, they end up with cyclic dependencies because they're just thinking, okay, uh, I'm just gonna, I did some very good job. I wanna reuse this all, all over the place. So be careful on reusability of uh, this kind of change. Um, and the way you can re uh, reduce the cyclic dependency is by reducing the package dependency. So be very uh, uh, attentive on what you want to um, import as a package dependency. However, um, a package imported by two bundles of the same version um, uh, can be, um, so package imported, exported by two bundles of the same version and the set of classes provided by each bundle can differ in OHDI. Um, and uh, sometimes you can get a package duplication, which is a not so nice thing. But you get the ability of swapping the implementation. So by having the semantic version range, you can swap your implementation in the background and never worry about the fact that you are importing only your um, API and range of it. So those being said, let's look about the jigsaw. Well, um, from jigsaw Java 9 Plus, we are not thinking too much of the versioning part because the build tools are resolving our dependency graph. So we are never um, thinking too much uh, when, you are when we are requiring a module um, and what version will be that module anyway. And that was a neat thing about Java 9, however, Java 9 Plus. However, um, having that inheritance of versioning and that open semantics that we used to have with the versions in OHGI, um, is something that we miss and we, our architecture might miss at some point. But we have the support of the multi-release chart, so we can create Java classes that are dedicated to be used per uh, Java runtime and uh, to be handled uh, diff and to based on the runtime to, uh, for the module to behave, had to be handled differently. Um, and that's one plus for that. Um, yet another um, plus for um, Jigsaw is the fact that cyclic dependencies are not permitted anymore. Um, that the package duplications, of course, not allowed anymore also. But we miss the dynamic updates and the possibility of having the semantic version range. Uh, semantic version range, especially when you're building a microkernel architecture, is very important because you're thinking, I've did something very well in the 1.1.0. I would want to be able to choose between those and um, not to um, not I mean, to make that dynamic and not to be um, um, uh, I don't know restricted only to a single version. Uh, so those being said, uh, let's talk a little bit about coupling. The thing is that many benefits of the microservices, such as isolation, um, independence, small unit of change, can be achieved also with monolithic architectures. If the developers are paying attention to coupling uh, and actually are disciplined about it, uh, the primary uh, challenge that we have as developers is the fact that um, we need to pay attention to our contracts, to the form that we are making this man in coupling. Um, to perform useful work in a microkernel architecture, we need to pay a lot of attention to the plug, to how the plugins are passing the information in and out of the core system. Uh, as long as the um, plugins don't need to coordinate between each other, do not need to use each other, developers can focus on the information and versioning of the core system. So this is a very important aspect. Do not 
um, interfere one location plugin to another. So if you are interfering them, you are always going to depend on, on each other, even though that you're tempted by reusing the code. Coupling in OHGI um, functions as follows. So the provider is the one that is um, defining the API. Uh, the packages, the classes, the attributes are all, are all controlled by the provider. By activating the service, by registering to the context, using the interface, um, the service object, and its attributes. This is how you are able to publish it and be seen by the others, uh, by the consumers um, in the, um, in, in the of the bundle. Um, the consumer, on the other hand, is searching the service interface that never looks for the implementation. So one way of tracking that, uh, specific, that specific service is by using the service tracker mechanism. Uh, simplified here. Uh, the service tracker is going to look in the context for the class, um, it's going to open the connection to it, and then it's going to get directly the service. Later on, you can use the service. So the consumer is binding directly to the business object. In OSG, in Jigsaw, sorry, <laughs> in Jigsaw, the provider um, can use an interface in a diff defined in a different module, a different jar and exposes that uh, implementation by using the provides paradigm. So you are providing the interface with the implementation uh, to the others. Now, the beautiful part of this is that um, this module here will be the one that's going to be uh, used by the consumer. And uh, so the same API is going to be used by the consumer. It will never look in the provider implementation part where it was, uh, what was it, the actual implementation, the module with the actual implementation. And it's going to say that it's using that um, API interface Be because the service loader uh, API is the one who is loading all the, all the interfaces or that are, or the services that are implement the um, order service interface. And it chooses for you, and you can choose from those all these um, all these interface, all these implementation modules. Well, you can choose from all these implementations. Um, which one will you use? Uh, most of the time, you have multiple implementations of the same serv of the same interface. Uh, you can use annotations in order to do, um, uh, pick which one would you like to use further, and uh, to um, uh, work with that even later. Um, from uh, the testing point of view, um, in the microkernel architecture, you are focusing more on integration testing. The thing is that unit testing uh, is something that's familiar for most of us, and end-to-end -end testing, mostly for the testers that are performing automated tests for Selenium. However, integration testing is very important because we want to test interactions, we want to test component activation, and we want to spot interface defects. And we can do that for OHGI with a framework called PAX exam. And if you're using uh, Java 9 plus uh, uh, implementation, you can use Wiremock. Um, it, so the integration testing is very important because you are also performing component testing. You are testing if in the bundle um, uh, your um, services got activated, your components got activated in the case of OHGI. And in the case of um, Java 9 plus, you're not focusing anymore on the activation, but you're looking that you have provided correctly the interface, uh, and that implementation is correctly being served to the others for consumption. And one question that I think uh, to everyone came into mind, is the OHGI working with Jigsaw or with Java 9 Plus? Well, true interoperability between GPMS and OHGI is something that depends. Depends on your needs. So starting with OHGI release 7, that was this spring in April, um, you can use the multi-release jars from the uh, Java 9 Plus. So an OHGI bundle can be a multi-release jar. And like in the example here, um, you can have classes that can be can serve to either Java 9 version and can be served also for the Java 10 version. So um, this is a very neat feature and uh, helpful for us as developers because we don't need to worry to which runtime we will use. In the past, we used to specify the Java version that the OHGI is running, the OHGI bundle is running with. Now we can specify multiple Java versions that we can run our own bundle. In addition to that, 
The bundled class path entries can be multi uh, can be multi release jar files, um, but this is the bundled class path is a feature that I personally don't recommend with uh, with OSGI because you are binding yourself to too much of a bundle, and I would recommend having the import package padding to be used meant to import only what you need. Um, those being said, I would like to thank you for listening to me. I know I was a little bit nervous. This is my first time <laughs> in front of you. Um, and please offer me some feedback, even though that is my first time here. Thank you for listening to me. And don't forget to write me a talk. <laughs> and we can talk afterwards a little bit more in detail. <laughs>